Tonight's guest is Heather. Heather, welcome to the show. Thanks, Vic. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate your time. Heather, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I am going to be 36 years old. I live in Connecticut, very small state, very densely populated. We do have a lot of forests and woods here as well, though. For the last six years, I have worked, I guess you could say, third shift. I worked as a bartender and Typically, my schedule would range from 6 in the evening till around 3, 3.30 in the morning. Where I live, just a couple streets away, is this sort of, I call it a beach. It's not a beach. And I, I want to, I really, really want to stress that because when you hear the word beach, you think of, for me anyways, you think of like the beaches in North Carolina or San Diego or, you know, anywhere in California, whatever, where it's just sort of flat sand and it's this big ocean. This is more of a little bit of an inlet. It's very, very marshy. There's really nobody around. The area is extremely rocky and kind of tough terrain. And behind that is a wood line. So in my free time, I would do a lot of walking down there. I have a cat. I'm engaged. And for the most part, I just keep to myself and I do a lot of artwork. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Sure sounds to me like you've carved a really good life out for yourself. I just hate the idea that you had to have those dogman experiences. Yes, I do too. That is unfortunate. In our first conversation, you told me that your dogman encounters totally changed your life, Heather. How so? Well, I want to start off by saying, and I don't want to offend anyone when I say this, and I, and I really, really, really want to stress that because I don't want anyone to get upset. But growing up, I heard of Bigfoot. You know, we occasionally would see things on TV and whatnot. And Bigfoot was never anything I ever really thought of. I guess I kind of put it in the same category as say like, you know, a unicorn or a fairy. I, I don't know. I just, it was never anything I thought of. And I used to see the people on TV beating the trees and whatnot. And I thought, what are they doing? They're chasing a ghost, basically. That was the extent that I thought about it. Never really ever crossed my mind. Growing up, I was pretty sure I'd become like a biologist, a field researcher. I really loved animals. Having this encounter, I feel as though... It, it was sort of a blessing and a curse, I guess you could say. I say that because um, it really shook me to the core and it made me change the way I see the world completely. It was almost like I took off these rose-colored glasses, I guess you could say, and now I question everything. We're told about lions and bears and this and that. These things are things we were told were myths. They were in movies. So when I had my encounter, you know, first off, I didn't even know what I was looking at. I, I, I never had ever heard of Dogman. I never have. And when I had the encounter, I I started researching it. I didn't even know what I was looking up. I started like Googling. I know it sounds crazy. I was Googling like werewolf type creature, canine type. I could not find anything. And um, I knew what I saw, it, what I saw was was flesh and blood. So 
for me, this wasn't like I was looking up anything paranormal. It wasn't until I stumbled across, I believe it was one of your videos about dog man. And I'm like, what, you know, what is that? Because this didn't look like a man. So why are they calling it that? And the name to me, it sounds almost so silly in comparison to what I saw. This encounter really for a while took me down. I couldn't tell anybody. I still have not told anybody because I, I just couldn't, I, I still can't believe what I saw. And how do you, how, how do you deal? I couldn't deal with it. I, I couldn't deal with it. It got to the point where I was never really a drinker. I never was somebody who really even liked an occasional glass of wine. I remember when I turned 21, a bunch of friends took me out and I never even drank. I gave all my drinks away that everybody was buying for me because I just never really liked the taste of alcohol. I started finding myself getting very, very panicky throughout the day. I ended up leaving my job over this because I was so crippled with fear of coming home late at night. I would leave work and by the time I got into my town a couple of blocks away from my house, I uh, I just started my, my arms First, my arms would start going numb. My hands started getting tingly, almost like when you know your leg falls asleep. That started what I felt like. I started to feel like um, I, I'm starting to get sorry. I'm starting to get that way right now. I would start to get very, very out of breath and winded, like I couldn't catch my breath, and like an anxiety attack. And this was happening so much. And, uh, I just, I would be at work and I, sometimes people would say to me like, you know, are you okay? I, I would just be in a daze because I could not, and I, I still obsess over it. It's not as bad, but, but then at that time it was just, I was obsessing over it. When I tell you it just took over my days. It literally, it was like a cancer. It just infested everything that I did. I grew up hiking here and there. I wasn't really big into the woods that much, but there was times I would just go for hikes back when I had my dog and I thought nothing of it. I will never step foot into the forest again unless there's a group of people with me and they are heavily armed. I will never. Sometimes there's times when if I'm coming back from a store or whatever, it's late at night and I have to drive down a road where there's like a lot of woods, a heavy wood line. I can't even look over into the woods because I am so afraid that I'm going to see that face. And um, I also, at the same time, part of me, and I know this is going to sound crazy because of how terrified, part of me was kind of sad at the fact that like, I don't think I'll ever see it again. And I want to because I, I'm so curious. But the only way I would ever want to see that again is if I was like in a car or somebody had one that was, you know, killed and they were examining it because I, I have so many questions. And so that's why I say it, it's a blessing and a curse. The blessing part is that it kind of opened me up. Not kind of, it did. It, it, it did. I'm not a believer of these things. I'm a knower. I know that there are things out there. But now it makes you wonder 
what else? You can't sit here and say, oh, I saw this, but Bigfoot isn't real. Or I saw this and the fey folk aren't real. How do you know? When you see something like this, it makes you completely question everything that you were taught as a child. And that's what it did to me. I question everything now. And at the same time, I can't tell anybody unless I'm amongst like kind. If I were to tell somebody, I probably, you know what that would do to me? They, they would think I was crazy. They probably would put me in a straitjacket. If somebody told me that they saw this thing before I had my encounter, I would think that they perhaps maybe needed to be evaluated by medical staff. I know that's what I would have thought before having my encounter. I would have thought that these people highly need to be evaluated. And yeah, so that's where I'm at. Well, if you would have responded that way, it wouldn't have made you a whole heck of a lot different from most people. Most people would think that if someone came out of the woodwork and told them about seeing a quote-unquote werewolf. So, it's not just you. If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, please go to dogmanencounters.com forward slash podcast. All right, Heather, please tell us about your encounters now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay. Well, I want to start off with the first encounter, which wasn't actually really an encounter, so to say, is that I saw something. And at the time, I didn't even know what happened. But hindsight, looking back, it does make me wonder if the two go together. This goes back to 2020. We were in the shutdown. I was off of work. And my body was still on the schedule of being up late. And I exhausted pretty much everything that I could do to keep myself busy from puzzles to organizing my house and whatnot. So I was very, very, very wired and awake in the evening time. And so I decided to leave my house and take long walks. And I would do that sometimes two, three times a day, especially in the evening. This one particular night, I walked all the way down to that marshy water area and I take a flashlight with me and I usually go down there to look for different types of shells. And it was a warm night. It wasn't hot. Um, It was very, very, very dark out and very still. Nobody was around. Not a lot of people go to this area anyways. It's it's not really an area people walk on, which is why I used to choose to go there. And I started walking. It bends around. It goes to almost like a horseshoe. I get to the very far end and I'm just, you know, slowly looking at the ground, pretty much when I would go out there, my eyes were always at the ground looking for different things. I noticed that, well, not noticed, I heard an odd sound. And so I stopped and what I heard, I'm not sure if I can recreate it. It sounded like a like a large man. And I know people are going to say, well, how can you tell the size of something by the sound? You can, you know, you hear a lion roar. You can tell there's a large amount of power behind it. What I heard sounded like a breathing out of some sort or a grunt. It was, you know, like a, (sighs) so I can't even do it, but it 
was enough to kind of shake me a little bit because I'm like, you know, I, th- I thought I was the only one here. So I turn around, I start looking around with my flashlight and there's nothing there. So again, I just want to say the area that I'm walking on, it's not a flat sand. It is tons of rocks. It's extremely rocky. It's hard to walk on. Every rock is about probably the smallest rock is like a softball size. It's they're very slippery. They're covered in algae. Aside from the rocks, there's all these sharp oysters that stick up everywhere. There are dead sea slippers. If you don't know what that is, you can just Google it. It's a type of, I think, mollusk. And these were all like, you know, dead ones, just empty shells everywhere. So it's hard to walk. If I'm not looking at the water and I look behind me, there is this very tall, thick, sharp type of plant grass. I'm not sure what it is, but it's about seven feet in height. And this stuff is dense, very, very dense. Beyond that, behind it, there is a wood line. I could see the trees towering over, whatnot. And that goes up sort of on an incline. So I'm looking around and I'm wondering, you know, what it was. Well, I thought, you know, I probably heard, just heard something. I I don't know. So I kept walking and I heard it again that, but it sounded like it was like right in my ear, like behind me. So I turned around again. I'm looking. I even took my flashlight at one point and I I was like looking into the water because I'm thinking, you know, maybe it's someone swimming. And then I'm like, you know what? No, you know better. No one's out here swimming. It's pitch black. And this isn't an area you can really swim in. So I got this fear in me. And the only way I could describe it, I think I told you last time, was that like when you're a kid and when you're younger and you watch a scary movie and then the movie goes off and later at night, it's like you're walking up the stairs and all of a sudden you get that like creepy feeling and you run up the stairs real fast. That's the kind of feeling I got, like, you got to get out of here. So I start walking as fast as I can back. And once I got to the clearing where I hit the road, I just booked it and went home. I told everybody about this. I, I told my sister, I told my fiance, I said, you know, the weirdest thing happened to me when I was down there. I said, you know, I heard these sounds and I don't, there was, there was nobody there. Oh, you know, everybody just kept saying there, maybe there was. I said, no, I know it. I know that there was nothing there. I, there. There was nobody there. It was just me. Like, and it's so frustrating when you tell somebody and they just try to rationalize it away. And I get it because I tried to too. Well, I really didn't think more of it, but I didn't go down there for a long time until last May. And that's when I had my encounter. So what had happened was, I believe it was called, I think it was called the flower moon. It was some type of super moon that was going to be coming out. And I was driving home. It was starting to get a little bit dark. And I remember as I was driving, I said, whoa, that moon is so big. It's beautiful. It was so big. It reminded me of, I don't know if anybody has ever seen the movie Bruce Almighty with Jim Carrey. And there's a point in the movie where he gets God's powers and he like lassos the moon and he pulls it closer and it looks giant. That's what this moon looked like. It was beautiful. And I'm like trying to take a picture of it on my phone and I couldn't because it's like I'm driving and then the tree would get in the way. So I got home and I thought, you know what, I'm going to go for a walk. My fiance was in Boston at the time visiting his friends. It was a uh, warm out, but it wasn't, you know, super hot. And I said, you know what, I, I'm going to go for a walk. Well, I left my house and I went 
left and I went all the way around, which is like the long way. And I just took my time. I was looking at everything and I get to that area. And, uh, so I get to the area and, um, I'm walking and I have my flashlight. It's now late. I believe it was maybe 10, 10 30, something like that. I don't remember the exact time though. And I had my flashlight and I'm looking around and I wanted to go down there because that would have been the perfect spot to take a photo of the moon. So I thought, let me go there because there's like a wide open area. I could have gotten a perfect shot. But while I was down there, I was shelling again and I'm looking down. And one thing I noticed, and again, I don't know if this has anything to do with what I saw or, you know, what I encountered, but I'm the only reason I'm telling this part of the story is because after researching all these things, I do think it's important to include every little detail because maybe it'll help people figure out what these things are or what they do. I don't know. I noticed there were tons of dead crabs. Now, I'm not talking, I've gone to that area during the day and birds will you know, when they come ashore, they'll pick apart them, whatnot. No, this was not like that. There was like every few feet. I mean, those like hundreds of crabs that had, they were not cooked. They were like pulled apart. Almost like the body, like there was just shells, like the meat was gone. There were shells and whatnot, the claws laying everywhere. And it was like all along the area I walked, there was just tons of them. And I did think that was like rather odd. I, and I was like, man, I hope somebody didn't come out here and just like do this because that'd be kind of cruel. But anyways, I kept walking and I start to get around the bend area. Uh, and near that bend area, there is sort of like a rock wall thing that goes out into the water a little bit. They're, they're big rocks. I don't know what you would call it. It's not like a pier or anything. It's just piles and piles of rocks that you can try to walk on, but it's really hard to. And I was heading towards that area because I was going to look for different wildlife, like crabs, to see if there was any, like, maybe I saw a starfish or whatever. But I got over to that area and I heard... I heard what sounded like that thick, heavy, tall grass stuff move. Now, this stuff is so dense that if anything's in, you can hear it when it moves. Like if the wind is strong enough, you can hear it when it moves. It's really thick. I didn't pay much attention to it, and I heard it again. So I turned around with my flashlight, and I took the flashlight, I lit it up. And the reason I did that was I, what I thought I was going to see is we have where I live, they're called marsh rabbits and they stay in that area, but they also sort of venture into the populated area as well. And they're very small. They're very thin. They're really cute. We also have little foxes. I, that 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 that's that's what I thought I was you know I was gonna see. So I I I have the flashlight and and I'm I'm sh I'm shining it at the, the base of the grass. And um, you know, Vic, I wasn't really sure what I was looking at because what I saw I saw I saw something. And then it was like my brain registered, that's a foot. I saw this foot, but this foot was big. I mean, it, it wasn't abnormally huge, but it, it was like a men's size, a men's size foot. And it was 
like like wide and it looked like it was like kind of gripping the way it's like the the toes and whatnot were curled down this foot looked like it almost looked like like a raccoon's foot that's kind of how I can describe it I, I've seen raccoon's feet and it looked like that, the way the bone structure was and whatnot. It, it was wider, much wider, but it, it looked like that and much larger. The area from where the toes were and the mid part of the foot was much wider. And it was like it was, I don't know, gripping down. So I'm staring at this and I'm like, what, what, what is this? What, what, what am I looking at? Because I'm not saying I'm a wildlife expert, but I, I knew, okay, this isn't a dog in here. What, what is that? That makes no sense. So I'm kind of getting creeped out because I'm alone here. I don't have any kind of protection. If something's going to come out, what am I going to do? Well, I just stood there. And I'm staring at this. And uh, then I heard a noise that uh, the only way I can really describe this noise, and it was similar, but it wasn't identical to that, was um, when people, I don't know, well, I'm sure you have, but when people will grab each other and they'll say, oh, can you crack my back for me? And somebody will cross their arms and the person comes behind them and they'll sort of like stretch them up and they're cracking their back and you hear like the bones, like, like pop. That's what this noise, I that's what the noise sounded like, but a little bit different and very loud while this noise was happening i saw this thing stand up this in oh my god it, it stood up and um i think at that moment I I've never been like in shock in my life but I think that's probably what they mean when they say like you're in shock like I did not know what the heck I was looking at I was completely utterly terrified I'm sure if someone were to take a picture of me, I think probably all the color drained out of my face. And it moved forward, stepped out, and, oh my God. Now, I want to emphasize that this was like in a matter of seconds that all this was happening. It sounds long as I'm telling it, but this all kind of happened within seconds and there were so many things going through my mind like you know is it this is it that is it this is that? and it's like nope 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 check it checking off in my mind it wasn't that it wasn't this I think the only way my mind could rationalize was I thought you know what I think I'm being pranked I bet I'm gonna be on a tv show People are going to come out. They're going to say like, ah, you know, we got you. I thought that that was going to happen. This thing, and I've said before, this thing looked like like somebody, you know, at Universal Studios or Hollywood had made this thing and put it in front of me. I say thing because I don't even know what it is that I, I still don't know what it is that I saw. This figure was, I want to say, probably seven feet tall. This thing 
was very, very, very big, but not, it wasn't like bulky. Um, it was, when I say big, hold on, sorry, I got to catch my breath. I'm like getting like, uh, getting like worked up. When I say big, I mean, in the sense that it was very defined, muscular, but more, more lean. You know, if you go to the gym and you see like bodybuilders and you see the guys that are like really bulked up, this wasn't like that. It was, this thing looked like it could have snapped me like a twig. Don't get me wrong, but it was not bulky. It, I can't even, I couldn't even believe that I'm looking at its legs and I'm like, this thing has legs, not legs like a dog, legs. They weren't like a human either. I, I don't really know how to, I don't really know how to describe what I'm trying to say. It was like in between the, the, the quads on this thing were, you could see, you could see the muscles. It had fur all over it. It wasn't long fur. It was short. Its ears were proportionate to its head. They were large, but they were proportionate to its head. On top of its ears, it had these bits of fur that curled outwards so it, it made the ears appear to bend curved outward but they didn't the ears themselves were sturdy like normal size it was like tufts of fur on the tips that made it go sort of outward its fur was huh like a mixture of colors. Growing up, we had Great Danes and we had one that was called a brindle, the type of coloring. For people that don't know what a brindle coloring is, it's like modeled, like different colors. It was darker, but it had, oh gosh, ashy gray, amber brown, Weedish blonde pieces all peppered throughout. The closest thing I could say the fur looked like was sort of kind of like certain like rough tree bark, like the types of trees that have like really thick bark. That's kind of like the coloring of it was. Its eyes were very, very, very ambery yellow. I really believed that it wasn't real but it looked very real it it didn't look like it was canine in the it looked canine but it didn't look like a wolf's face it had a different look about it it also had what looked like, oh God. And the only reason I, I'm thinking of this is because I had seen a photo online and I was like, that's kind of what it reminded me of. It kind of was hyena-like. Now, I want to emphasize for people who are out there and might be skeptics, this was not a hyena. Not in New England. I'm sorry. It wasn't a hyena. It was standing up. It had very short fur all over its body, but there seemed to be this fluff or like, a, I don't want to say mane because it didn't look like a lion's mane, but it was like this patch of, of hair from the low part of its neck down. That was the only part that I saw that looked a little bit longer. 
the way the face looked, it, it, it kind of resembled like a hyena, but also not. I know I'm like ugh, terrible at describing, but again, I, I really, I don't have anything to compare it to. The strangest part for me about its body was the arms. In, in the way it stands, it it never seemed to stand straight up. It seemed like it was, um, like, have you ever seen the way kangaroos stand? They sort of stand like they're leaning forward and their arms sort of curl for like, like, like they're almost like going to bear hug you. That's how it had its arms. Its arms were long, very long. That was the only part of the body that I felt was like out of proportion. It was, it was so strange. Its hands, I'm going to go back again to raccoon. Its hands reminded me now, yes, it had like what looked like fingers, but the hands reminded me of like raccoon hands. But again, bigger. I saw it, it had claws. They weren't hooked in the sense like I have a cat. They weren't like that, but they, they, they were large claws that were, were bent down. And the ugh, bad with body parts from the elbow to the shoulder was shorter and from like if you look at our arm it seems to be our arm is even like from the elbow up to the shoulder and then the elbow down to the wrist seems pretty even this was not like that from the elbow to its hand was long longer much longer not proportionate and it was just standing there dangling, dangling its hands, and it's staring at me. Now, this whole time in my head, I'm still, I think that I, I know when you go through grief, they say that there's different stages of grief and one of them is denial. I believe that I was in a sense in denial that this thing was real, even though I'm like, you know better than that. It's freaking real. It's in front. I could, I could see it breathing, blinking its eyes. The part that I think really sold me and like kind of made me snap out of it was it opened its mouth and it had its mouth just like kind of like, I don't know how to, like just kind of like slightly open. And there was, what appeared to be dripping. It was like dripping a little bit. And that's when I'm like, okay, this is real. Like you got to go. I freaking lost it. I have never in my life felt fear. Like I have felt when I, when I looked at that thing, and I, you know, I, I've been in scary situations before. This trumps that. This was a feeling of like, I, I think, I really believed that I was going to die. There was no way that I was ever going to see the light of day again. There's no way, no way looking at that thing. No way. Now, I wanted to get out of there, but the only way for me to get out of there would be to go past it. If I go to my left, that goes like into the woods. There's, there's no way for me to go left. I would have basically been running towards a trap. I, I, I couldn't go left. I had to go right. But in order to go right, I had to go past this. So I'm like, I didn't know what to do. And 
like I, I think I had mentioned to you when I initially spoke to you that I, I was, I wanted to leave this part out, but I, I can't because it's part of the story, but I don't want people laughing at me for my decision because I, I'm sure if, if there was a big camera out there and it was recording me, it, I would have looked so ridiculous and silly, but all I could think of was get in the water. That's the only thing you could do is get in the water. But all this is going through my head within seconds. Okay. All this happened in seconds. So I start slowly backing up. I'm slipping. I'm sliding. Again, this is really rough terrain. And once I got ankle deep in the water, I turned and I just booked it as fast as I can into the water. Now, I do want to say one thing. This was like two hells for me. One, I'm staring at, I have no idea what I'm looking at. I'm staring at something that is a monster. And two, I'm terrified of water. I'll go in pool water and that's pretty much it. I am terrified of bodies of water. I would go to the beach in the past as a kid. I do not get in water. I've always been afraid of just what's in there. And I'm not a good swimmer. So for me to turn and run into the water, I I didn't even, it was like I had no control of my body. I just, I I don't know. Maybe it was adrenaline. I don't know. I didn't even think twice about it. And I'm literally like wading through the water, pushing as far as I can. I'm now pretty much chest deep in water and I'm going and I'm going and I have to get around the bend area because that would have put me pretty far from it. And then I could have gotten out and gone home and I'm wading through the water and I turn and I look and it does this... (sighs) It does a bizarre move, and the only way I can describe it is you've seen guys in the military, and they'll say, like, about face, and it's almost like they get on the balls of their feet, and then they do a really sharp turn, left or right. They pivot. They're very statuesque when they do it. Their head doesn't move. They're just, boom, they turn. That's what this thing did. Cause I'm in the water. I'm watching it. Cause I'm like, well, is it going to follow me? Like what? Like I, I, I need to get home and I, and I'm, a, I'm screaming. I'm in the, I'm like, help somebody help me. I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. I was crying. I mean, and I know that there's nobody around, but I just was, I don't know. I, I, like I said, I, I, I was losing it. I was literally losing it. Well, when I look over it, it did that weird turn, almost like it couldn't move its head or something. It was bizarre. And I saw it go back into that grass patch and I'm flying through the water. I didn't even know, but like my legs were getting cut up. My ankles were getting cut up because it's, we're talking sharp, big oyster beds, rocks. This is, this is not an area you can really go in. I finally get around to the bend area. I get out. I have to jump over this wall. I'm, I mean, I, I'm like panicked. I got to go home now. I look, I don't see it. I, it's like I supermaned over that wall and I flew home. I've never ran so fast in my life. I'm soaking wet. I never ran so fast in my life. And the whole time I'm running, I'm like looking like, is it, is, you know, is there another one? Is there three? The the things that go through your head, I didn't even, if I were to go outside and run as fast as I did, I'd have to stop. I'd be out of breath. But I must have had such an adrenaline dump because it wasn't even like I was thinking of that. I'm just like, get home, get home. I have to go blocks now. I finally get home. I go inside. I lock my door. I run upstairs into my room and I look my I look my legs you know they're they're wet they've it looks like I've got scratches and 
not big, big cuts, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty banged up from the water. And, um, you know, I was bleeding a little here and there and I sat on the edge of the bed and I, we keep a nine millimeter in our nightstand for home protection. I got that out. I sat it next to me and I now know, cause I didn't know what was going on, but I was having trouble swallowing. I was having trouble. I was getting winded. Like, you know, I'm getting winded right now cause I'm reliving it. But this was like, I could not catch my breath in my heart. I really thought Vic that I was going to have a heart attack. My heart was beating so fast. I felt like I was choking. I would swallow. I would like, could swallow. I'd swallow again. And it was a panic attack. I now know from looking into it that I had suffered a panic attack. I'm, I'm honestly surprised I didn't suffer a nervous breakdown. I mean, I was completely, what was that? And for days, I'm not even sure. I know that night I never slept. I'm not really sure how I didn't end up in the hospital because I, I just, I, I, I I still struggle with what I saw. Um, and then after a few days, after I calmed down, I mean, it took several days. I was like a zombie, just reliving it in my head over and over and over again. I was like, I need to, look, what is this? I get online, I'm looking. The only thing I could think of was it kind of looked like a werewolf from a movie, but it kind of didn't. So I'm looking stuff up and I just, I felt like I couldn't find it anything. I couldn't find anything. And I'm like, maybe I should tell someone. Somebody needs to know what's out there. This thing is, this, this thing is like a, a walking, breathing, killing machine. Just by the way that it looks, this thing could just, if it wanted to, it could have probably just ripped the front door off my house. No question asked. Somebody needs to know what's out there. And then I'm like, nobody's ever going to believe what I saw. Something that was standing on two legs. And I'm not talking in the sense that like I've seen bears stand up. No, this thing was comfortable standing and walking on two legs. How does that exist? Well, I finally, you know, like I said, I stumbled across the whole dog man thing and I went down, I must have listened in one day, just hours and hours, 10 different encounters on, on, on your channel alone. And I'm hearing people say similar things to what I saw. And I'm just like, I can't get over it. And, and in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, for the longest time, I thought, and I still waver on what I think that the government, they, they do a lot of weird things, you know, in, in, I'm not really, well, I wasn't a conspiracy theorist at all. Um, I was, I guess you could say more science-based. There's a reason for things. There's always an explanation. This looked like somebody messed around and tried to create something and it got loose. That's the only thing I can think of. But then I'm like, if this thing, if, what if there's more of them? That means they have to breed. So are there more of these things out there? And then I also toy with the idea because there's so many accounts of uh, from credible people too. Like th I heard this one story of a, of a cop who pulled these guys over 
and they were Mexican and they didn't speak much English. And as he was asking for their license, they looked over into the woods and they started freaking out and they were saying, Lobos, Lobos, Lobos. And they sped off. They took off on this cop. And when he looked over, he saw one of these things and he put like three rounds into this thing's chest and it didn't even affect it. Well, that cop ended up drinking himself to death because of what happened. And it makes me wonder if maybe there's some sort of entity. I don't know. I really don't know. But all I know is this thing did not look natural at all. And as far as what I believe that they are, I I don't, I, I have no idea. But I really sometimes think that the government knows about these things. I, I mean, they have to. And why are there so many more sightings now? Why is it? And I think there are. I think people have been seeing these things for a long time from what I've been reading. It's just that now we have podcasts where people talk about it. We have social media. We're in an era where people are much more open than they were even just 15 years ago. I mean, people, you know, used to say even just, you know, you'd say Bigfoot and people would laugh. Now it's like, it's very, people are a lot more open to the idea of these things. So that's why I think we're hearing more of it. But I am still obsessed. I wanted to get my story out there because I want people to know that I'm not saying live in a bubble and stay in your house. If you enjoy hiking, you know, go for it. But you really need to be careful and you really need some sort of, you need some sort of protection when you go out there. Because if this is real, if what I saw is in fact flesh and blood, then what else is out there? What else is out there? I mean, this is just like the tip of the iceberg for me. I hope people come forward and keep telling their stories and keep giving every little detail because I think sometimes these encounters are really weird and sometimes they do sound outlandish and crazy. But if people leave things out, it might be that little missing link that we all need to figure out what is out there. Now, where I live, this state is pretty densely populated. Now, don't get me wrong. We have a ton of forests. We do have a lot of uninhabited land. But I can't understand why it was here. That's the part that coming from the science-based part of it, it doesn't make sense why it was where it was. And that's why sometimes I go to the basis that this was something that got loose. I don't know, but that's what happened to me. That's my encounter. And as long as I'm alive, I will never, ever, ever forget it. I'm sure you never will forget that. I'm so sorry you had to experience all those things. In your opinion, Heather, do you think that dogman was there that night to get away from people or to lay in wait for unsuspecting passers-by? like yourself? I don't know. I often wonder if maybe it was feeding and I stumbled across it feeding and I interrupted. For all I know, when I first went to that area, it could have been walking around and like ran into the tall grass and I just didn't see it because my eyes were literally just constantly looking at the ground. So I would have never known. So it could have been out there. I don't know. I mean, there's tons of rabbits. There's tons of fox. It could have been eating that. It, for all I know, it was eating those all those dead crabs. Again, I don't know. I know that sounds crazy, but th- it is crazy. So maybe it was there because, I mean, it could have came. It had to have come out of the wood line. From where, I don't know. But again, I don't know why it would have been in that area other than maybe to eat. That's the only thing I'm thinking of. We do have a lot of deer here as well. There could have been deer in the area. 
but where that area is, there's a lot of rabbits and fox. So perhaps it was eating and I just sort of interrupted it. I, I don't know. That's the only thing I can think of. I, I'm really not sure. Well, when it comes down to it, there are tons of reasons why he was there that night, but all that matters is the fact that he was there and unfortunately you saw him. If you've had a dogman encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest on one of my two Bigfoot shows, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let me know. When you had your first experience, you told everyone who'd listen about what happened, but they all blew you off. Is that the reason why you didn't tell anyone about that sighting? Yes. My fiance has a degree in science, and he's somebody that just, he doesn't believe in much. Same thing with the paranormal and whatnot. He doesn't believe in ghosts, doesn't believe in anything. He always says, nope, there's an explanation. The house is probably on a tilt. That's why things are falling. If he can't touch it and see it and smell it, it doesn't exist to him. He's just hardcore, this is how things are, and that's it. My sister is pretty much the same way. She also has a degree in science. I just feel, I really think that they would probably be like, is she okay? Did something happen to her? Like, did, in, in question my sanity, because Vic, I would do the same thing. Had this not happened to me, I, I would have done the same thing. If somebody came up and said that they saw this, I'd be like, well, maybe what you saw was a wolf or some sort of animal with mange or this or that, but nope. That's not what I saw. I know what I saw. And until there's actual proof, I'm not sure that I'm going to share it with anybody because I, I do think that it can ruin your credibility. I mean, and then sometimes it doesn't. There was a judge, he came forward, oh gosh, years ago about his encounter in the 70s. And this is a judge that came forward about his dogman encounter. And people listened to him because he was a very credible stand-up guy within the community. I just think also talking about it is really not something that's easy to do. I research it in my own time, but I really try not to think about what happened in order to deal with it. I feel like I've had to kind of like just put it in a box and lock it away. I had to say to myself, this happened and it happened to me and, and I was there, but I can't keep dwelling on it. And I know that that might not be what therapists would say is healthy, but that's how I deal with it. Why it didn't rip me apart, I have no idea. I have no idea why these things do what they do or what they are, it never really made, again, I don't know if it made any noise because when it stepped out, my ears started ringing like a, hmm, like this like humming noise. And it was like, I didn't even hear the ocean water. I didn't hear anything. I just, even on my way home, my run home was like a blur to me. And I think that that's from the adrenaline. That's the only thing I can think of. Oh, I'm sure your run home was like a blur. And yeah, that definitely was adrenaline. And what you told us about not wanting to share this experience because you felt you'd be laughed at or not taken seriously. That's what I call being in a prison without walls. Really is a shame you had to deal with that. Did knowing that your fiance would rebuff you if you tried to tell him about your sighting damage your relationship with him? First off, he knows I'm not a liar. I just think he would say, oh, it must be some sort of species, you know, or, or, or something with a condition, you know, or you were so scared that you thought you saw that. Like, that's just how he is. He sort of has to reason things away. I think eventually I will tell him 
in the last year, he's become more open to different things. What I actually have done is I've said, I heard these podcasts. They're very, very interesting. And I played Bigfoot Encounters for him. And in the beginning, he was just like, there is no way. How could these things exist when they're so big and nobody ever sees them and this and that? But it's just like anything else. I live in an area where there's tons of black bear here. There's tons of them. I've never seen one out in the open by myself, but people do. So it's, I almost feel like people don't realize how big the forests are. It's almost just like the ocean. Only a certain part is explored and how often you would have to be in and out of those woods to even catch a glimpse of something. And for the most part, things just run away or blend right in. But there was a couple episodes I had played for him where I started to see him kind of come around. And typically he does that when he hears it from people who are like anthropologists or field biologists, people who understand and are around animals enough to distinguish what's normal and what's not. So it's not that he wouldn't believe me. I think he would just think what I thought at first, that maybe somebody was pranking you. But I have to tell you that this would have had to have been a $10,000 costume or animatronic or something. But I've never even seen anything in, in making of movies that can move like this if it was fake. But that's pretty much how his brain operates. And, you know, I, I have to respect him for it. You know, we're all different. And I was no different than him until I had mine. I never thought any of that was real. I thought it was just people who wanted to believe people that thought it would be fun to think that there's something like that out there. But no, I now know I'm not a believer. I always say I'm a knower. I now know that if there's that, I don't know what else there is. But I don't really think, at least in our lifetime, that we'll ever really get an answer as to what they are. I think that there's a lot of cover-up that goes on. And this is just based off of the amount of stuff that I have read and the amount of encounters I've listened to. I think that the government absolutely knows that there are these things out there. And for whatever reason, they're not going to admit it. I mean, think of all, if they were to admit something like that, can you imagine some knuckleheads who'd be like, oh, let me get my 12 gauge or we're going to go hunt this down or go into the, it, it, it would, it would cause probably more problems than these things actually do. And sometimes I think maybe that's why there's like protected national parks and whatnot. I don't know. My mind could go on and on and on with this stuff forever as to my theories, but none of it really matters until we've actually would have a body in front of us dissected. We'll never really know. Yeah, as you know, don't hold your breath for that either. And as far as your fiance goes, I sure hope he does come around to the point where you can openly share that experience with him soon. I think that'd help you tremendously. From what I understand, you sought professional help. How'd that pan out for you? Well, I'm not ashamed to say that shortly after I did have to go on anxiety medication for a little bit. And the reason why is it was just, I wasn't sleeping. I was having random panic attacks. I mean, I could just be sitting on the couch and all of a sudden what they called it was paralytic panic attacks. And what that is, is I guess it's a little different than a regular panic attack where people feel like they can't breathe and whatnot. This would be like my, my body would start shaking, almost like convulsing. It would be debilitating to the point that it would feel almost like an out-of-body experience. You can't think right. It's an awful, awful feeling, and I feel for anybody that's going through it. My anxiety attacks now have lessened 
there are times I will say where it will come on, but I pinpoint when it is. And that's when I have to go near areas where it's heavily forested. For instance, near Christmas time, we had to go to my fiance's parents' house and they live out in the boonies. They live out where there's tons of forests and bodies of water where there's a lot of wildlife. And the street that you have to go up is very narrow and you're just sort of surrounded on each side. And I remember just thinking, is something going to jump out? I mean, this thing looked like it could have just easily jumped from what I saw. It could just rip a car apart. So it's times like that, that I will have to take my medication. As far as what I told the doctor, I did not say what I saw. There was no way I was going to say what I saw. I'm pretty sure they would have admitted me. there's no way. I, I was not coming for it. I just said that I'm having anxiety. Um, this is how I feel. And they asked if it was caused by anything. And, you know, they did like an evaluation. And no, there was no way I was going to tell them. But I do think that if anyone's suffering, it's okay to seek help. I'm not saying use medication as a crutch, that's not something you want to do either. But before that, the reason why I sought out help was because, like I said, I was never a drinker, but I was finding myself taking a shot here or there to calm down because all of a sudden I'd get late and I'd start thinking about it. Or before I left my job, it was getting ready to close. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, let me just to calm my nerves, I have to have a glass of wine. And it's funny because even the people that I worked with at the time, they were like, oh, you're having a drink? Because they knew I was never a drinker. I had to leave a high paying job. I made a lot of money. Not a lot. Wasn't making millions, but I made really, really good money. And I think that was probably the part that gave me even more anxiety. I, I had to leave. I just, I I couldn't do it. I couldn't work that late because it was becoming such an issue. And I knew that this was going to turn into an issue for me leaving every night. And so that's why I say the whole blessing and the curse thing. I feel privileged that I saw something that most people don't see. But at the same time, if I had the choice, I wish it never happened. Because it did do it did do some damage, I, I believe, in my life. So that's pretty much it. Yeah, unfortunately, I say it did quite a bit of damage to your life. That's horrible. Did you have trouble with nightmares after having that experience? Oh, unbelievable. Yes. Yes. Terrible. There was a time where I'd be fine all day. And then it's like come bedtime, I did not want to go to sleep. It was like the dread of having to go to sleep because I knew that I'd lay there and I I didn't want to shut my eyes because every time I'd go to sleep, it was like I was reliving the encounter, only the encounter was different. It's chasing me. It's right behind me. And, you know, in your dreams, for some reason, it feels like you never can run fast enough. It happened on and off for weeks, not too much anymore. And I think it's because I feel, I don't want to say that I feel like it's gone. I just think that it wasn't really supposed to be around here. Maybe it kind of stumbled here. In the beginning, I kept thinking, maybe it lives over here, or, but I don't. I think it was all happenstance. I'll never know why it was over here, but as time has gone on, I mean, it's been close to a year now. I've never seen anything again. And that's just sort of 
what I have to tell myself to, uh, I guess to get by that. I, I think it's gone. And so, yeah. But in the beginning, I, I think most of the nightmares were fueled with, is it around here? That was the part that really left me constantly reeling. But again, I don't know about these things. I, I, I don't even know. There was a time where I wasn't even sure after when I was looking up dogman encounters that that's what I saw because it seems like there's different types from what I've heard. You hear people say that this one looked like this or this one was colored like this and but also people are different too. Some of us have tan skin, some of us are pale, some have dark hair, some have light. So is it like that with these things? Like I I don't know. Same thing with the Sasquatch encounters. You hear some people describe them looking more human-like, and then you hear some people say that they look almost like a baboon or, or like wolf-like. So for the longest time, I wasn't really sure what I saw. Did I see what they call the devil monkey? I, that's another thing I heard. I, I wasn't really sure. I still don't know. I just have the picture in my head. And I really wish that I could sit down with like a sketch artist and have him draw what I saw. Because I, I think if I had it on paper, I, I know that sounds crazy, but I feel like maybe it would give me some sort of closure. Because I, I, I tend to keep thinking about it because I feel like I don't want to forget what it looked like, even though it was horrific in it and it terrified me i don't want as time to go on i don't want to forget what i saw if you'd like to work with a sketch artist i'm pretty sure i could set that up her name is sibylla Irwin, and she's very talented i'm gonna reach out to her and ask her about this and once i hear back from her i'll let you know what she had to say yes i absolutely would love to do that that's something I've been thinking about recently. And I'm, I'm not a good drawer, so there's no way. I mean, if I were to draw, it would look like a five-year-old's drawing. But I would love to sit there and describe what I saw and hopefully have it come at least somewhat close to what was out there. I think that would help you a lot. Well, like I said, I'm going to contact her about this. And also, like I said, she's really talented and she's a really nice lady. So I think you'd like working with her. But once I hear back, like I said, I'll let you know. Thanks, Vic. Oh, you're welcome. From how you described his leg structure, I'm still a little confused here. You said its legs were a cross between that of a horse and a human. Did it have hocks and stifled joints like a horse or ankles and knees like we have? Oh, no, no, not like a horse. Not like a horse at all. The muscles that I saw in the quads reminded me of like a, oh God, like a short distance runner in the Olympics, how you can see the uh, the striation of like the muscles, like how they bulge out. That's what the thigh area looked like. The lower part of the leg was much thinner much thinner but it was still built don't get me wrong it wasn't like there was big quads and it had sticks for for shins no it didn't but they were just the legs reminded me somewhat of a dog but not quite and i know that doesn't help but it's I heard a guy, listen, I'm going to use this analogy. I heard a guy on one of the shows one time that I was listening to, and he had a Bigfoot encounter, and he said, if nobody has ever seen a bear before, and you tried to explain what a bear looked like, and you would say to them, well, it kind of looks like a dog, but it doesn't. Well, so... This thing, you know, that he saw, he said, it kind of looked like a human, but it didn't. It kind of looked like an ape, but it didn't. So it's like, how do I describe? That's the only way I could describe what I saw. The thigh area 
looked kind of human like but not really and the way the the lower leg looked was ah uh, I wish I could draw it it was thinner it did not have it didn't it wasn't like a horse and its feet looked I don't want to say pat like paddles but they looked really wide like the way that they flared out um they just they they just just flared out and they they very much reminded me of a raccoons but wider same thing with like the hands the hands were the hands looked like they could hold stuff but it would be like uncomfortable to do so and i know that might sound odd but I keep going back to raccoon because that's just the only animal I know of that had a similar structure to what I saw. Again, I don't know how long I stood there looking at this thing. I mean, it felt like a long time, but it wasn't. I I know it wasn't. I was not going to stand there and stare at this thing, but I did get a good look at its I kept staring at its arms and hands because that was the part that just looked almost cartoonish. And and what I mean by that is I saw a photo online of a Tibetan fox. Now, I want everybody to think of a regular fox and then Google this image of a Tibetan fox. When you see it, it almost looks fake. So like if you were in the wild and you didn't know what this Tibetan fox was and you saw it, you'd be like, what What was that? It almost doesn't, it looks like someone drew it. That's sort of how, that's sort of how I can describe this thing. It looked bizarre. There was nothing about it that looked like, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I don't, I don't know why it was built, it was leaning, it looked like it was falling forward. That's why I don't know if it can get down on all fours. I never saw it down on all fours. I only saw it when it was crouching down in the grass. And I did not see how it was crouching down. I saw the foot curled and I saw how the grass was somewhat bent around something. So I knew something was there. So I never saw how it was when it was down. Was it down on all fours? Did it have only one hand down? That I don't know. I just know when it stood up and what I saw, but I just kept really focusing on the arms because I thought that they looked so bizarre. And I think that there was a picture on one of your shows one time. I'd have to go through and find it. That was the closest thing to what the legs and arms looked like. I'd have to find that photo. And I also have photos of the area that I could always send you of the grass piles and the wood line. So you have an idea of where I was when this happened. Yeah, that would be great if you could send those pictures. Please do. Another thing the way it kept its mouth slightly open. When we first moved into our house, when our cat came in the house, because it was a new area, I said, what is Jake doing? He's walking around and he has his mouth slightly open. Well, I looked it up and apparently some animals, there's several animals that do this. They have these glands in their mouth that they use to take in a lot of smell all at once. And now looking back, maybe that's what it was doing. Maybe that's why it it had its mouth slightly open like that. Again, I don't know. But these are all things that go through my mind when I start thinking of it. But it did remind me of when my cat had done that. Yeah, those organs are called Jacobson's organs, and that's called the flim. I think it's pronounced Fleeman response when a cat, a horse, an animal that does have Jacobson's organs, it's basically a supercharged way of smelling things. Yes, that's exactly what I remember reading. And again, I don't know if that's what it was doing, but it 
thinking back to it, I'm like, I wonder maybe if if that's why it did that. Well, that might be, but canids don't have Jacobson's organs, but who's to say that this dog man was actually a canid? We don't know. And to touch back on that leg question, you got a pretty look at its feet. Could you tell if its heels were on the ground or not? It didn't look like it. It looked like it was, I don't want to say on its tippy toes, but it just seemed like a lot of the weight was like on the balls of the feet. And I say that because the, I'm trying to think of the part of the foot from the mid part of the foot forward looked flared out. And then, but this part I only got a quick look at because when I was, when I was really wading through the water, I mean, as fast as I could, and I turned to look and it did that weird turn. When I came home, not that night, but I'm talking days later, I kept thinking about the way that it turned and I tried to recreate it. And the only way that I could recreate it is for me to get on my feet, the balls, of my feet and turn that way. I, I wish I could record myself doing it so you could see what I mean. But it was very, it almost looked stiff when it did that. I'm sure this thing could turn its head, but it the way that the head looked and the way the body looked when it did that turn, it looked so stiff. Like it went up on its balls, its feet and just pivoted. And so when I saw the feet, I only really saw the front part of the feet. I never saw the heel, but the way it was leaning forward. And again, I, I don't know why it was doing that. I never got the impression like it's going to attack. It just looks like that's how it was standing. And another thing, I've heard people on your show say they saw genitalia on certain ones. I did not. Well, I did and I didn't. I didn't see anything in the sense that I thought it was a male or anything like that. If anything, I, I, I would assume that it was a female because I didn't see any male parts down there that I, I'm pretty sure I would have seen. It didn't. It just looked like all from the stomach down was flat. And I'm pretty sure if it was a male, I would have seen that because I got a very good look at the front of it and there was there was no male parts. I can only imagine what it must have been like to go through all that. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, Heather. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? The only thing I, I guess I would say is for those that really are just hardcore skeptics or even if there happens to be scientists on this show, please, please, please never stop being curious as to what's out there. I know a lot of academics they're taught that this is what's there and whatnot, but you have to remember that there are new species that are found all the time. Can you imagine the first person that said they saw a narwhal before they knew it was a narwhal? There had to have been some guy who said, hey, I was on a boat and I saw this whale-like creature with a long unicorn horn. I can't imagine the ridicule and the laughter that ensued when he told them that. But we now know that it's real. Or the giant squid. I think about that guy in China, the fisherman, who kept telling people, I see these giant squid. And nobody believed him. Scientists told him it was impossible until he brought them out there to the location and they saw them. Same thing with a platypus. The people that saw a platypus and said, oh, you know, it's this mammal-like creature, but it has a duck bill. I, I mean, these were all cryptids that are now true. So I guess I just want people to have an open mind that there's stuff out there that we don't know of. 
and to just at least have an open mind when people tell their stories. Don't always discount it and never stop learning, I guess. And also just be really careful when you do go into the wilderness. Just be really mindful. And that's all I got to say. Well, that's all very well said and very good advice. Heather, I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing the details of those experiences with us. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me, Vic. It's been a pleasure. Well, you know you're welcome. Thanks again so much. Have a great night.